This video is sponsored by Skillshare. Hey, hey, Mark S. House with you here, and today we have a bunch of exciting topics to cover. We'll kick off with the Starship development news for the week, including some exciting road closure news indicating a potential flight during the week, but just as interesting, some incredible 3D animations showing the Starship construction process in simple clarity, along with a brand new and intricate animation demonstrating the inner workings of the most advanced rocket engine in the world. This Raptor engine will blow your mind. We have a bunch of other updates that dropped during the week as well, such as SpaceX's latest GPS-3 mission, updates on OSIRIS-REx, and Starlink's ongoing public beta testing results. Topping all that off, just a little news from my neck of the woods. Yes, the Radio Antenna Deep Space Station 43 in Canberra, Australia has just been reactivated after some lengthy downtime. This is the only dish capable of sending commands to NASA's Voyager 2 spacecraft, so great to have that back online. Kicking off with Starship development news, the crane that was used to stack SN8's nose cone has now completed its job and was moved back to the production facility. Soon thereafter, Starship SN8 then completed its second run of tests ahead of its flight later this month. On Wednesday morning, SpaceX completed what looked to be a cryogenic proof test of the nose cone's liquid oxygen header tank. These header tanks, of course, are an important part of the success for SN8's flights as they hold the reserve fuel to be used for the landing burn. Although several tests stand between SN8 and flight readiness, we are now closer than ever to seeing Starship SN8 lift off under the power of the three Raptors, aiming for that altitude of 15 kilometers. Then for the first time, those body flaps will come into play as SN8 belly flops back towards the Earth. And now it looks like we have a preliminary date for this flight attempt as per road closures published by Cameron County. Starship SN8 could potentially be ready for its historic launch this week week with primary closures announced on November 8th in the evening between 7pm and 1am and then also primary closures between 9am and 9pm on both November 9th and November 12th. Some backup closures as always scattered in there on the 10th, 11th and 13th as well. All of these reference the launch designation SN8 static fire and 15km flight so we hope to see this series of tests play out and good luck SpaceX on the flight. It is worth mentioning that over the last week Elon Elon Musk did shed some light on the fact that SN8 is likely to succumb to a failure, saying that a lot can go wrong and that a rapid unplanned disassembly right off the launch pad is possible. Fortunately, SN9 is almost ready as well. Now, if a failure did occur during SN8's flight, such as the engines not relighting or a body flap not working correctly, no human life or any of the facilities will be in any danger. Just like Falcon 9, Starship SN8 will target the water until the last few seconds. However, Elon also added that if it fails right at the end, some landing pad repair will be needed to fill in the crater. Elon was also asked if they planned to live stream the flight, to which he replied sure, although he further summed up the ambitious goals of the flight, saying that it might be quite a short live stream. A lot can go wrong. SpaceX there saying that they will provide the video with warts and all. We'll see every frame that they do. Now, if SN8 manages to fly successfully to 15 kilometers and initiate that belly flop maneuver, that that will be a major data point for SpaceX. We see right here Elon saying that they've tested a subscale version of the Starship in the wind tunnel with its body flaps activated to close the loop for stability. He did say that this version of the software will probably work at scale, but reality tends to bite you. Therefore, it might take a couple of full scale flights until a Starship successfully completes that extreme and never done before belly flop. He also mentioned the ultimate goals that the team has for this flight. He said that a stable controlled descent with body flaps would be great. This would help to understand exactly how the flaps control pitch, yaw and roll during descent such that the ship is positioned well to relight, flip and land. Also, transferring the propellant feed from main to header tanks for the landing burn would be a major win. Now, there is also news from the build site. Work is once again continuing at an extreme rate. Firstly, a five ring stack fitted with internal stringers was spotted with a label saying SN9 nose cone barrel. This stack will connect SN9's nose cone to the tank section. Now on that note, SN9's tank section was rolled out of the mid bay sporting these aero covers that was then moved inside the high bay. Now SN9's two aft body flaps were lifted and installed onto the side of the vehicle soon thereafter. This 
this made way for the stacking of SN10's tank section. This section of course functions as the rocket's airframe, propellant tanks and the engine mounts. The only major work that remains is completing minor external and internal plumbing, fully installing avionics and finally installing the ship's aero covers and flaps. Also what is believed to be SN12's forward dome, common dome and aft dome was also spotted by Mary. To sum up, all this is once again Brendan's weekly build diagram. Seeing all of these vehicles and parts together just shows the sheer amount of work that is taking place at SpaceX's Boca Chica facility. Furthermore, a new thrust puck was delivered to the site over the week. This new puck has many differences over the previous designs. The main difference is that the methane downcomer now connects directly to the puck itself with the liquid methane manifold that splits into the three feed lines that runs to the Raptors now seemingly being external. This could possibly be a new thrust puck design for SN12 and above. Let me know what you think in the comments below. And thanks Raphael for making this diagram for the community. Go follow his work there on Twitter. The high bay is looking more and more complete as well as weeks go on. Hopefully this means we will be seeing some action in the high bay very soon with the first super heavy booster being assembled. This high bay is just massive and here we see it height wise in a perspective that really shows the difference between it and the height of the mid bay there. Can you imagine seeing this super heavy being rolled out of the high bay? What a monster. It will be around 72 meters tall just for the first stage. Who knows what we could be seeing rolled out of here by January just a few months from now. Speaking of which, thank you very much for all of your engagement on this. We get so many questions and assistance from you all, which helps a lot with the research. Your support of the channel here is just amazing. Every like, comment and subscription always helps a huge amount. We are so thrilled to be on the track to hit a quarter of a million subscribers very soon, and that is all because of you. Thank you very much. Now to top all of this news off, a big thank you to Corey here for creating quite the incredible video of SpaceX's Raptor engine. This is presented in full 3D with cutaways so that you can explore in intricate detail the inner workings of this incredible piece of engineering. Yes, this is the world's first flight proven full flow stage combustion engine and you get to take a tour following the cryogenic liquid methane here. This of course flows through key areas of the engine including the engine bell to keep it cool, followed by flowing up to the methane preburner. Using a small amount of liquid oxygen, the fuel rich mixture ignites in the preburner, driving the turbo pump. On the flip side, the reverse happens with the liquid oxygen, which is ignited in the oxygen rich preburner. Both preburners ignite, driving both turbo pumps, and of course, sending the full volume of methane rich and oxygen rich gases into the Raptor engine combustion chamber with incredible force. With more than 200 tons of thrust and over 300 bar of chamber pressure. This is the most advanced rocket engine in the world. Awesome work there, Corey. After you finish here, make sure you go and check it out in its full glory. Link for that is in the description. There is just such amazing support from so many sources that help to keep us all up to date with Starship development. Huge thank you, of course, to Boca Chica Gal with NASA Spaceflight. Make sure that you are following all the news as it happens right from the source. Likewise, the incredible perspectives from above by our GV aerial photography. It is amazing what insights we can get from that elevated perspective. Now we have much more Starship information to talk about, but first, huge thanks to Skillshare for supporting today's video. Skillshare, of course, is an online learning community with thousands of inspiring classes for creative and curious people. You can quickly explore new skills, deepen existing passions, or just get lost in creativity. It offers memberships with meaning and with so much to explore, real projects to create, the site empowers you to accomplish real growth. Skillshare offers classes designed for real life and all all these circumstances that come with it. And these lessons can help you stay inspired, express yourself, and introduce you to a community of millions. Your passion could be in film or video, it could be photography, graphic design, animation, or illustration. The incredible work we present on this channel are great examples of many of these skills. Now, given that I've recently moved to working with Premiere and After Effects, I've been wanting to explore adding a little more motion within videos. Sure enough, here I could join artist and animator 
Chris George to learn how to get started with animation skills that I didn't know. While aimed at beginners like me, this class is also valuable for intermediate animators looking to deepen that fundamental knowledge. Skillshare is curated specifically for learning, meaning that there are no ads and they are always launching new premium classes so you can stay focused on your creative goals. It's also incredibly affordable at less than $10 a month with an annual subscription. So if you would like to help support me and would like to give it a try, the first 1,000 people will get a free trial of Skillshare Premium Membership. Just follow the link in the description below. So yes, the Starship builds are certainly progressing very quickly now, and I think it's good to remind ourselves of scale every once in a while. Take this animation beautifully created by Deep Space Courier and released during the week. What immediately gets me is the scale here of that teeny tiny dancing Elon Musk shown alongside that one ring segment. This is the skirt section created from four of the massive steel rings. Inside, stringers welded within support the huge mass of the Starship. The thrust puck is the centerpiece here that will support the massive thrust of the Raptor engines once installed. Then of course, legs need to support the full weight of the vehicle, yet another reason that those stringers are so important. Seven more rings up before we get to the common dome, the dome that divides the liquid oxygen tank below and the liquid methane tank above. The downcomer and liquid methane header tank fit in here, finalizing this whole section. Now four more rings higher, we see the forward dome capping off the liquid methane tank. At this point, there needs to be more stringers to support the fairing and nose above. The tanks below, of course, are pressurized, so no need for stringers within those segments of the Starship. And there we go, we cap all of that off with the nose cone containing the liquid oxygen header tank. That feeds the oxygen needed for landing all the way down to the bottom of the vessel. That also helps to balance the vessel out in its final stages of flight. Without the mass up here, the vessel would be too bottom heavy and much harder to control. Speaking of control, there we have the aft fins and forward fins. Now, the Raptor engines planned in current iterations of the Starship include the three sea level engines which are currently being tested on Starship serial number 8, and in future the plan is for there to be the three vacuum optimized engines as well. These we believe are still to be pushed outside and potentially fixed to the skirt itself. So there we have the full size of this monster, which becomes immediately apparent with Dancing Elon there again providing that idea of scale. Finally, we have the future heat shield tiles that are intending to cover the full belly of the beast. This is such a wonderful way to present the build process right there, and I highly recommend heading over to Deep Space Korea's full video on the YouTube channel because there is a lot more beautiful content like this dropping very soon. This week we finally got to witness the launch of the GPS-3 mission on Thursday the 5th of November. That had been a waiting launch for quite some time with earlier aborts and delays from weeks ago. All went to plan on Thursday though with the mission launching on time on the booster designated B1062 which was a brand new Falcon 9. Due to it being a night launch the scenes of the booster trajectory and re-entry were not quite as nice as in the daytime launches but once again completely uninterrupted footage of the landing on the drone ship, of course I still love you. Now this same booster we believe will go on to launch the fifth GPS-3 mission in mid-2021, as was reported in October where the US military announced that they would begin to use previously flown SpaceX rockets. This is very exciting as it shows a growing level of trust in SpaceX's reusability. Just after an hour into the flight, the second burn kicked off, accelerating that payload over 2,000 meters per second, placing it into an elliptical orbit. That was then followed by the spacecraft deployment at around 1 hour and 29 minutes after liftoff. And there we see it floating away to prepare to place itself into its final orbit at around 20,200 kilometers in altitude. Yet another perfect mission there for SpaceX. Now, a few more quick updates on SpaceX's Starlink Beta. Many users are starting to share their experiences, confirming that the satellite service can provide fast broadband speeds and low latencies in those remote areas. SpaceX's public beta test is giving some users at least download speeds of more than 160 megabits per second, according to the speed test provider Ookla. That makes it faster than 95% of US connections. The initial results here are really quite astounding, so if you're trialing it, please do share your experiences in the comment section below. We'd love to hear from you. 
Now just after posting my video the other week containing the segment on Osiris Rex, we had a bunch of comments confused as to why the sample collection footage simply turned into an eruption of debris. Now to explain this a little better, we've more recently been provided with a secondary view from one of Osiris Rex's navigation cameras. Now this series of images shows NavCam 2 as the spacecraft approaches the surface of Bennu, touches down and then fires its thrusters to move away from the surface. Looking at the initial footage at this point, the images become an immediate mess and it's a little difficult to really spot what is going on. The site here was named Nightingale and the preliminary data shows that the sampling head touched Bennu's surface for approximately six seconds before it started the back away burn. Now this is of course longer than it appears when we watch the footage, but just remember we are seeing more of a slideshow of images rather than real time video. This can change your perspective quite a lot. So diving deeper into this, what we see is the sampling arm shadow coming into view here. The reason the touchdown looks so hectic is because the sampling head impacts the site and almost immediately fires a nitrogen gas bottle in order to collect the sample. What you need to keep in mind here is that the mass of Bennu is only around 78 billion kilograms, not a lot, and its gravitational pull is very tiny. Putting that into perspective, Bennu is estimated to have around 100,000 times less gravity than here on Earth. So with near no gravity, a small burst of gas will send debris floating all over the place. And that is what we see here in this beautiful shot as the vessel pushes away. We see this clear cloud of debris just floating a little above the surface. You can see here the sampling arm shadow again visible mixed in with the newly disturbed surface material. In the top here, it looks like this is where the sample mechanism has pushed down into the surface. So yes, as research continues, we hope to see a lot more imagery and information come to light. It is going to be super interesting to hear more about this mission as it continues. Of course, slightly older news that I hadn't specifically covered here was that the sample taken had overfilled the collection unit, which was causing a little concern. The decision was soon made to stow away the sample earlier than originally planned to limit the loss of as much of the sample as possible. This this essentially sealed it away for return to Earth where it will re-enter for analysis. As far as we know, that sample has been stowed away successfully. Now just a little news from my neck of the woods from Canberra, Australia. Ever since March this year, the only radio antenna capable of sending commands to NASA's Voyager 2 spacecraft underwent a major hardware upgrade, including two new radio transmitters. Now this dish commenced operation in 1972 and supported the Apollo 17 mission as required. At 64 meters wide, the dish was expanded to 70 meters in 1987 to increase its capabilities for the Voyager 2 flyby of Neptune in 19. So after the upgrade on October 29th this year, a series of commands were sent from the 70 meter wide dish. Just over 35 hours later, the Deep Space Station 43 or DSS 43 antenna received a reply from Voyager 2, which is now over 125 astronomical units away from home after its launch in 1977. Just incredible stuff here. Being in the Southern Hemisphere, the DSS 43 dish is the only one capable of commanding Voyager. Voyager 2, and that is due to its flyby of Neptune's moon Triton back in 1989, which pushed Voyager 2's trajectory into a downward path from the orbital plane as we see here in this animation. Having the dish offline for an extended period of time has been less than ideal, but manageable thanks to the other dishes on site. These can actually be combined to at least collectively receive data sent by Voyager 2. So yes, awesome news that the antenna is back online. The upgrades done here will benefit the Mars Perseverance rover scheduled to land on Mars in February 2021. It will also ensure communication and navigational support for any future Moon and Mars mission. Now I just wanted to say a huge thank you to my amazing patrons here. There is just no way that we could continue creating content at this frequency and length without you. The support that you all here provide allows us to increase the time that we can spend and that is all thanks to the growing list of patrons that we can see right there. Thank you each and every one of you. As support increases, that helps the whole team. So if you like what we're doing and would like to join our awesome patrons here, head to patreon.com slash Marcus That gives you access to interact with me more directly via the linked roles on our 
Discord server. You can have earlier access to the videos to watch before anyone else. And you can also have your name listed right there like all of the other amazing people. A massive thank you as well, especially to Brenton, Adam and Brendan assisting greatly with video production. And of course, the entire quality control squad here for helping me research and proof the material for these videos. If you're interested in these topics and you'd like to be a part of this, follow me on Twitter and please do get in touch. In the tile in the bottom left today, we have my video last week. Do check that out if you haven't spotted it yet. In the top right is my latest video and in the bottom right, content that YouTube has selected from my channel just for you. Thank you everyone for watching and we'll see you all in the next video.